change is coming, my friends. I felt a breeze today. In this dark, empty place, I felt a breeze. I saw a little pinpoint of light. Barely anything. And I heard someone. Someone laughing in the distance. Not at me. Not with me. Just laughing. As if they couldn't help it. I heard them last week. Remember? Someone was with me. Someone has been with me for the last week. They won't show themselves to me. They won't speak to me. But they are here. I'm not sure who it is. But I have the feeling that I will find out soon. It reminded me of a story. And I must tell you that story. Because that has been sustaining me in this place and in this lack of time. Telling you my stories. I must tell you this one. That is all I have for you this week. A story. And the promise that Something is coming. Here is my story for you. And for whoever else is here, listening. Once there was a man who was traveling a long, tiresome journey. He had been traveling for a week's time, and his pockets were getting lighter and lighter and his satchel with food and provisions was growing emptier and emptier. He had come from a place far, far away. He had traveled to seek his fortune, for he had grown tired of farming the land and working the soil. He was tired of the green of the grass and the warmth of the sun. He wanted more from his life. He wanted money power, the love of many, the fear of even more. He wanted the things that the powerful, wealthy folk who rode by him in their gilded carriages and looked on him in disdain, pity, or mockery had. The little farm he'd inherited wasn't enough. The company he kept in town wasn't enough. He wanted more. And so, He'd sold everything he had to travel. And here he was, his shoes nearly worn through, his soul weary, and his heart angry. Just when he thought he might collapse from exhaustion and unhappiness, he heard the strangest sound. It was a fiddle. Playful, mysterious, and clear as a lark. He followed its sound to a fork in the road. In the distance he saw a figure in white robes, standing and playing the violin, dancing a little to their own beat. As he came closer and closer, and the figure grew closer and more clear, he saw in the warm glow of sunset what appeared to be a woman. She grinned broadly, her eyes closed in pleasure at the sound of her own music. Her hair was very long and very, very unkempt, with little branches, leaves, and flowers peeking out of its matted tufts. Her eyes were shadowed by deep, dark circles, and her fingers were all bone, her knuckles swollen and crooked, yet her hands moved swiftly and gracefully with the instrument. Her fingernails were long and dirty, 
and he wondered at how she was even able to play still. But she did play. She played that tune that seemed to mock his fatigue. Her feet, which he couldn't see under her long white skirt, moved deftly with the song. She even seemed to hum a little with it. The man found himself moving towards her, though he wasn't quite sure why. When they were face to face, she stopped finally and opened her eyes. They were green, greener than anything he'd ever seen before. She opened her mouth, and her teeth were green and brown. She was all dirt and grass, this woman. Ageless, filthy, beautiful, and her smile unfaltering. Weary traveler, what do you seek? She asked him. He found himself answering truthfully, though he knew not why. I seek my fortune. I have traveled a long way to make something of myself. She laughed and clapped her hands, her fiddle nestled in the crook of her arm. And what are you now, then? He shook his head. Perhaps it was the journey, or the sun beating down on him all day, or perhaps it was the hypnotic glow of sunset that seemed to circle the strange fiddler in a glowing orange aura. But he could not keep the truth from her. I'm just like everyone else. She grinned and nodded, for she understood him. I have the remedy for that, she said, and held the violin and its bow out towards him. Take it. Play the song you've heard this night. You'll know how to. I promise. It will bring you whatever you desire. The man reached out, hesitantly, and took the instrument. I cannot pay you for this, he muttered. She smiled and bowed her head. No need. She seemed to continue her strange dance, though the music was only in their heads now and not in their ears. Come back to this place in seven years to bring me back my fiddle. That is all I ask. And she turned and danced off into the sunset, her bent and bruised hands still moving gracefully. And the man traveled with the violin in hand. His feet somehow seemed lighter, perhaps, even just knowing that he might be able to sell the damned thing for a meal. By morning he had found a city. Large, busy, and booming. He was so tired and so hungry. Yet, looking at the instrument, he found he could not sell it. Not yet, anyhow. He smelled the torturous smell of bread baking and meat cooking outside of a tavern, and his stomach ached to have some. And so he stood at the corner of the place, and he raised the violin with trembling hands and he brought the bow down across the strings. The woman had been correct. He knew the song, and he somehow knew exactly how to play it, even despite the fact that he'd never played any instrument in his entire life. He closed his eyes, and the playful, mischievous tune brought a smile to his weary lips. It brought a dance to his aching feet. And he heard people all around him clapping and whispering to each other how very lovely the music was. And soon enough, an innkeeper appeared from the door of the tavern and welcomed him inside, where he had bread and meat enough to fill his belly, and a warm fire and a soft bed to rest himself for as long as he liked. He barely let himself wonder if the woman had been right, and the fiddle could bring him whatever he desired. 
He was so grateful to be safe and warm and full and happy. Do we think this was enough for him, my friends? Was it enough that he could eat and drink to his heart's content, and be safe and warm in a place among kind, admiring friends? Of course it wasn't. In the days to come, he would play the fiddle in the square. Little children would dance to the song. Adults would swoon and be lost in their happiest memories at the sound of it. He left a hat out, and soon enough it was filled with gold, for gold was what he desired, and so gold came to him. And of course this wasn't enough for him. He wanted more. He wanted much more. He bought himself fine clothes, and he desired to go to the palace and play his song there. He thought this as he played the song one day. And, sure enough, an emissary from the castle came to him, entranced with his song, and demanded he be brought to play for the king and queen. And he went more than willingly. The king, the queen, and their beautiful young princess came to hear the stranger play his song. He played it and he smiled broadly at the sight of these grand people looking at him with such wonder and admiration, especially the lovely princess, who he now coveted more than anything. As he played, he thought only of how he wanted her. But more than that, he looked around the great hall at the beautiful gilded mirrors, the marble floors, the fine statues and paintings, and he wanted it all. He saw the crown atop the king's head, and he wanted it. He wanted to marry the princess, and he wanted to become king. And do you know what happened next? He was invited into the court. He must stay at the palace and be the king's musician. Within a week, the princess fell in love with him. Within a month, they were wed. Within a year, the king died and left everything to the stranger with the fiddle. At first, he could scarcely believe his luck. But, my friends, the thing about luck is that when you have a lot of it, it becomes less impressive. It becomes expected. He ruled the kingdom selfishly, but no one knew it really, because his music was so wonderful. He desired the people's love, and he had it, even though he did not earn it. He had it only because he desired it when he played the woman at the crossroads tune. He used the song to win wars, to gain more power and land and riches. He used it to get anything he wanted. His new queen bore him a young prince, and they both loved him immeasurably. But he couldn't help but wonder if it was false, some kind of spell. Did they love him, or his song? And he could not love them back. Not fully, and an empty pit sat in his heart. He could only try to fill it with more conquest, more power, more wealth, and more music. Seven years passed. He pretended to himself that he forgot about the woman at the crossroads. He told himself that he might yet go some day, just not this day or that day. Of course this was a lie, for, deep down, he knew he had no intention of returning the instrument. The seventh year came and went. He went about his life and scarce thought about the woman on the road, until he began to see her. At first it was just a glimpse as he rode into his city after being away for battle. He was on his horse. 
His adoring people waved flags and threw flowers at him for his victory. And he waved listlessly at them. And they all had wide eyes and open mouths as they called out their praise. But one person did not. There was the woman, with her green eyes, her long white skirts, her crooked and strange hands, and her immovable smile. He only noticed now that her ears were slightly pointed. He was deeply afraid. He had expected her to look angry or upset. But she didn't. She looked amused, as she had when he met her. He kept riding on, though fear sat in his chest like a boulder he'd swallowed. And he didn't stop seeing her. At first it was in crowds. When he held court, he'd see her among the nobles. At grand balls, he'd see her among the dancing guests, not moving at all herself. At banquet, there she would be seated at his table, not eating a thing. She was haunting him, he thought to himself. He told his guards to be on the look for a woman with bright green eyes, pointed ears, and a terrible smile, branches in her hair and dirt in her teeth. They would try not to show their confusion or concern at the order. No one saw such a woman, but all were on lookout. Capture her at once. Kill her, even, if you have to. But one day, while he was seated at his throne, he looked to his wife. She was looking at him adoringly, as always. But the longer he looked at her, the more that adoration turned to amusement and mockery. Her teeth seemed no longer white. Her eyes seemed no longer brown. Her hair seemed no longer shining and braided. He looked at her, and he saw that woman. He tried to find comfort in his son, but when he looked at the boy's face, normally open and honest and innocent, he saw only that same mockery and condescension. Soon everyone's face around him was replaced with that woman's face, and it was driving him mad. He returned to the crossroads on horseback, violin in hand, but she did not come. He screamed for her. He played the violin. He stomped his feet and roared at the sky. But she did not come. At least, not immediately. For when he returned to his palace, he entered through the front doors to the great hall, and he noticed strange, dirty footprints in his hall. No, not footprints some kind of animal's prints, some kind of animal with hooves. And the prince led all the way to his throne, where the woman sat in her dirty white robes, with her matted hair, her beautiful and infuriating smiling eyes. And had he not noticed it before, she had two little horns on her head, tucked in among the immense mop of hair. His son sat on her lap. His wife sat wrapped at her side. All the guards and the nobles and the courtiers stood, entranced. And she sang the song. It held the same power it had when he played it on the violin. Even more, perhaps, because this woman, this creature, wielded an ancient kind of power that he didn't understand. He walked up to her, and no one noticed him at all. No one rose for their king or greeted him. They were in the palm of her hand. Take it back, he said, extending the violin out to her. She smiled and nodded, 
taking it. She kept singing, and everyone kept listening. Take it back, he shouted now. Give me back my kingdom. She smiled and kept singing. Give me back my life. He screamed now and ran towards her, his hands reaching for her throat. And she stopped. And it seemed that the color began to drain from the great hall. The gilded mirrors grew gray and faded and began to peel and fall like dead leaves. The paintings, the statues, the marble, the people, the clothes, the crown. Everything crumbled and fell to the ground, autumn leaves falling and crumbling and blowing away with the wind. He realized that he was not in a beautiful, clean palace in a shining city. He was in what appeared to be an old ruin. A ruin of... something. Some ancient place. He could see between the crumbling stones that it was nighttime, and everything was gray. Threadbare trees were all around him, and the ground was carpeted with moss and mud. There was a stone throne, intact, and she still sat there. Above the throne was an ancient carving, some symbol he did not understand. On either side of him were statues, most crumbled apart. But what he could gather was that they were ancient depictions of horned creatures, disheveled, smiling, mischievous creatures with pointed ears, some with flutes, some with drums, some with lyres. They were naked from the waist up. From the waist down, they had goat's legs, covered with fur, and ending with awkward, angled, and terribly large hooves. And then he heard the hooves coming towards him. It was her. She no longer wore her white robes. She walked down the stone steps from her throne, now not hesitating to show him her horns, her ears, or her legs and hooves, just like those of a goat's. A tail brushed its way back and forth behind her. She held her violin at her side and stood to face him. Welcome, traveler she said with a smile. And the words, Welcome, Traveler, echoed all around him in a symphony of voices. Welcome, Traveler. Men's Welcome, voices. Traveler. Women's voices. Welcome, voices that belong to both and to neither. He looked around, and he saw an immense crowd of people, kneeling, their eyes on the fiddler and only on her. She extended a hand to the traveler's face, where she cupped his cheek gently. You're not the first to fail my test, and I'm so glad you did. When she took her hand away, it left a muddy print on him, marking him as her own. She turned away from him and raised the violin. She began to play it and everyone around him began to sigh, to gasp, to laugh, to sing. Their eyes were desperate, their expressions were weary, their costumes seemed to belong to different times and places. Yet here they were, and the song was still beautiful after all those years. And the traveler found himself laughing and crying all at once, for all that he had lost, for all that he never had, and for what he did have now, which was a playful and destructive ancient creature 
an old god of mischief, music, and games. She always won the game. They all danced with her to her song, for that was all they had now, and it was all they would need. Did you like that? I thought you might. I hope you liked it too, my friends. I hope you have a good rest. I hope your week goes well. And I hope to speak to you again next week. I'm not sure what will happen. But I'm sure I will find you again. And speak to you again. I'm sure. I think. Good night, my friends. Hello, and thank you so much for tuning in to episode 80 of On a Dark Cold Night. This is Kristen. I'm your host. I'm the writer. I'm the podcaster, composer, production team, etc. behind the show. I hope you're having a lovely weekend. A couple of thank yous are in order today. First, I'd like to thank Julia R., who left us a very kind recommendation on our Facebook page. Julia writes, I'm obsessed. I don't know what I'll do when I'm caught up with all the amazingly creepy stories. I love all things creepy and macabre, so this is the perfect podcast for me. Thank you, Kristen, and please keep the stories coming. Thank you so much for taking the time to share those words with me, Julia. I'm so happy to hear you're enjoying the show. We have at least 19 more stories coming. Uh, when I hit 100, I'll take a little break, but then hopefully not terribly long after that, I can get started on season two for maybe another 100, question mark, deep breath. Next up, I'd like to thank Erica, who supported the show by buying us four coffees on coffee.com. Thank you so, so much, Erica. That really means a lot. If you'd like to help out like Erica did, you can buy us a coffee too at ko-fi.com slash darkcoldnight. Or you can become a patron of the show on patreon.com slash darkcoldnight, where every patron receives access to the full soundtrack of the show. You can also help out like Julia R. did by writing us a review on our Facebook page, on iTunes, or on Stitcher. A couple of other great ways to support are listening to the show on the free Radio Public app, where every listen goes towards paying your podcaster. Also, you can check out our t-shirts and hoodies at bonfire.com slash on-a-dark-cold-night. Thank you again for listening. I hope your Halloween season is treating you well. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. It's been a long weekend here for me, and I'm really enjoying a bit of time to relax, breathe, and just um, take in October. All the best, my friends. Take care.